the unfortunate and tragic killing of uh, international aid workers uh, here with the organization the world uh, the world kitchen uh, is very sad unnecessary should not have happened and of course needs to be uh, addressed quickly by the IDF and by Israel so far what Israel has done and I think that's a good thing is to own responsibility to take responsibility to say clearly that this was Israel's doing not anybody else's and that uh, to express uh, regret and condolences that's a good start now what Israel needs to do in order to allow aid organizations to go back and work and do their absolutely crucial work of providing food to Palestinians uh, who have been living for more than 17 years under Hamas oppression what they need to do now the IDF is to investigate present the findings of the investigation very transparently and then make sure to make the necessary adjustments to protocol and to techniques on the ground to make sure that this uh, that the likelihood of this happening again is extremely extremely low because frankly i don't think that there is international tolerance for this uh, to happen again and i don't think that israel will be able to weather another crisis like this uh, it's a sensitive time it's a crucial time and looking at the big picture it's even more so sensitive from an israeli perspective because israel wants to get rid of unra the un relief and works agency which is nothing more than a front for hamas uh, at this stage it has been basically uh, reduced to that and uh, in order for the idf to be able to do that then we israel needs another aid distributor and other organizations that are willing to step up for the good of Palestinians in need not in the support of Hamas that's why this incident is it comes at such a sensitive time and uh, I hope that the IDF will uh, do the necessary adjustments uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen again and also uh, discipline the people who were involved in this tragic mistake of a misidentification of an aid vehicle full of aid workers uh, instead of terrorists. I was a reserve officer who was who reported for duty on October 7th, the 9th of October 7th. I reported for duty. I understood that this was going to be a long and horrible war that would take time. It wouldn't be a short operation. And I called my friends in the IDF spokesperson unit and said, what can I do to help? Where do you need me? Do you want me to go down south and take international media to show them what's going on down south? Of course, at the time, nobody really understood how bad the situation was. So that's why I proposed that. I didn't know that the South wasn't safe to go to and it wouldn't be safe for three or four days until the IDF finally got a handle on the situation. But what I offered was, do you want me to go down South? Do you want me to come to the HQ and help you there? What do you need? And they were under tremendous pressure. And of course, you know, uh, probably the most challenging environment and uh, they didn't really tell me what and then I said afterwards I said listen what you will need I told the the current spokesperson is for somebody to give you a few hours of rest so what I offered the current spokesperson uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Hecht is I'll do the night shifts so that you can get a few hours of sorely needed sleep because this is going to be a marathon a long haul and if you are to manage this and to do it well, you need to sleep. Believe me, I've been there and I've done it and I know what it is to try to be a spokesperson without sleeping. It doesn't end well and that's why I will gladly do the night shifts. That's how three months of uh, reserve duty started with um, me basically volunteering to do the night shifts and uh, I didn't think that there would be so many interviews and so such a demand but it turns out that you know prime time east coast and central u.s time and morning shows in australia 
uh, and a bit of international India as well. And uh, at the end of three months, I'd done hundreds, if not more, of interviews and briefings, dozens, if not hundreds of online briefings on the idea of social media accounts, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook mostly. And uh, I had the opportunity to uh, um, go to Shifa, the Shifa hospital, and uh, expose a few of Hamas's lies and how they are endangering civilians there and uh, show that to the world. Uh, so it was three months of reserve duty, very intense, quite challenging. Uh, we're now almost six months into the war. And for three months, I've gone back to civilian life. I'm currently a senior fellow at an American uh, think tank called the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, based out of DC. And uh, I continue to speak on behalf of my people and my nation, not behalf of the country and not behalf of the military. I'm not in any official position. I see myself as somebody trying to help and to communicate our perspective, our situation to people that are honest enough and kind enough and willing to listen. And you mentioned Shifa Hospital. Uh, there have been two um, major uh, idea of sort of incursions into yeah. the hospital. Can you talk about the first one and the second one? Yeah, very, very different, by the way. So we have to explain a little bit about the situation in the Gaza Strip before we go into the details of Shifa. So the Gaza Strip, when you look at it, if you if you look uh, had had a bird's eye view or a street Google Street view of Gaza before October the seventh, what the naked eye would see is a Middle Eastern Arab society, the typical typical square buildings, a lot of neglect, a lot of uh, underdevelopment. Uh, some areas are very posh and developed and nice. The areas where Hamas officials live and those that are close to Hamas, they have uh, quite convenient lives like in the Rimal neighborhood in uh, Gaza City, but not, not only. But then you have squalor, poverty, um, dirt and disrepair in many parts of the Gaza Strip. What you don't see are any military bases. There's no you know, perimeter with a armed guard at the entrance and a gate that says, welcome to camp, I don't know, Salah Adin, headquarters of Hamas in Gaza. And you don't see anything the likes. You don't see this is the main storage facility of Hamas. This is our logistics. This is our weapons depot. There are no signs and there are no, there's no official military infrastructure. Everything is embedded within the civilian population. Everything is within civilian infrastructure. And the hospitals uh, in Gaza, we know that now with the benefit of hindsight, but we assessed it before, hospitals were really pivots and hubs of Hamas activity. They, in their analysis of themselves, the terrain that they have, and of their enemy, of us, what we are limited and restricted by, basically international law, and that we do not target humanitarian facilities like hospitals, like schools, like mosques, like UN facilities. That's exactly where Hamas chose strategically, systematically to position its most important assets, either in schools, hospitals, mosques, and other and UN bases, or underneath, in tunnels underneath. So when we speak about Shifa, we are speaking about a compound that Hamas built underneath the hospital and an overt presence inside the hospital above ground in the various clinics and buildings, including in the administration. And for many years, Hamas operated using Shifa. We saw it on October 7 that they brought Israeli hostages to Shifa. One of them was unconscious, the other one was conscious, and they were treated at the Shifa hospital knowingly by the medical staff, and Israel exposed that afterwards with the CCTV footage. So Shifa, we called it, and I think in hindsight, this wasn't the best wording. We spoke about the headquarters, and there was a significant buildup before the first time that we took the Shifa hospital of a Hamas headquarters in Shifa. Headquarters creates lots of expectations, we probably would have been wiser to call it a node or a hub or an important asset, but the fact of the matter that Hamas 
systematically used the hospital for illicit military purposes, undeniable even for a presenter at Al Jazeera. There's clear visual evidence, there's spoken evidence, and there's remains, weapons, ammunition, tunnels, etc., that are irrefutable. The fact that Hamas illegally and while doing so endangering civilian patients used the Shifa hospital for military purposes in contravention of international humanitarian law, in blatant disregard of it. Was there any way that the doctors and nurses there didn't know? No. I think not. I think that an extremely small amount of people, of staff, can claim that we didn't know. It was the untold secret. Hamas, armed Hamas thugs, ruled the, uh, the Shifa hospital, and there were areas that were off-limits for staff, uh, where Hamas simply had an above-ground presence, the entrance to the tunnels, parts of the MRI clinic, and a few other locations that were off limits to everybody else, but you would see Hamas guys with uh, weapons and everything uh, controlling part of the hospital. So for anybody to claim, of course not the management, maybe you know a sanitary could claim or maybe a nurse could claim, but management, doctors, anybody who had an overall understanding of what was going on in the hospital cannot honestly claim that they didn't know. So. That was going on, and as Israeli troops were advancing, after Israel first made sure that there were almost no civilians in Gaza City, we called on the civilians to leave. It took us three weeks to basically persuade civilians that it would be a good thing for them in the interest of self-preservation to actually move out of northern Gaza and go south. That finally happened. Israel made the move on Gaza took and fought various areas and then made the way towards Shifa, seeing on the ground that Hamas terrorists were uh, retreating back towards Shifa and that it became an important kind of pivot for Shifa, uh, for, for, for Hamas. And uh, I remember when we, I joined the troops, uh, I went in there because it was so important for us, for Israel, for the idea of to show how Hamas was abusing that hospital. I went in with the, actually with the fighting troops, with one of our special forces, and waited for them to do the preliminary clearing and search of the building to make sure that it's safe to go in. And then the moment that they found weapons and military gear, I was called in and we then filmed it and exposed it. Um, then our troops investigated underground. They basically scanned all of the buildings around the Shifa complex, the grounds themselves inside the perimeter and inside various clinics and facilities to find openings or shafts to tunnels. Took us a few days, maybe a week, and then we found quite a lot of tunnels, including tunnels that we then exposed to the world and we had international media uh, see it unedited firsthand with their cameras inside the tunnels and we also showed uh, our footage of it with drones etc. Uh, Shifa was used by Hamas as a, as a hub for operations. They managed operations from there. They Part of the, uh, the, the, the hostage taking process went through Shifa and through and through used by Hamas. The fighting continued. Israel went on to fight in the central camps in uh, Nusirat and a few other parts in central Gaza, and then went on to fight in Khan Yunis in southern Gaza. And since there's a finite amount of Israeli troops, the troops were pulled out of Shifa uh, without, by the way, causing any uh, bodily harm to patients. Very important to emphasize. Um, troops went on, and what the IDF saw as months went by were more and more intel indications popping up that Hamas operatives, including very senior ones, high-level commanders, had went, gone back into Shifa and were now using it again to sustain themselves, to manage Hamas in northern Gaza, and also to run military operations from it. And what the IDF did, together with the ISA, the Israeli equivalent of FBI, uh, which has a lot of human uh, sources, was to launch a surprise attack on uh, Hamas operatives inside Shifa. They were caught unawares. Uh, dozens were arrested on, within a few hours, and a total of now 
more than 500 operatives, I believe the summary was just released yesterday, more than 500 members of terror organizations, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, were arrested, some of them very senior, some of them rank and file, many of them rank and file, but some of them very senior. About 300 terrorists were killed in, within the Shifa compound. Uh, lots of weapons were found, dozens of AK-47 ammunition, RPG launchers and their ammunition, explosives, uh, millions of shekels in funds that Hamas was either distributing from there or storing there in order to uh, manage its uh, operations in northern Gaza and to go back to governing Gaza by using money. Um, so it was, I think, a in in all in summary, a tactical success. It, in, it indicated to Hamas that nowhere is safe. You can hide in a hospital. You can hide in a mosque. You can hide in an UNRWA school in or above it. You can hide underneath UN headquarters, UNRWA headquarters. Nowhere is safe. We will get to you. Israel will get to you wherever you are while respecting and fighting according to international humanitarian law. In the action in Shifa, not a single patient was killed. Yes, there is structural damage because Hamas fought against Israel and wherever there was fighting, eventually uh, there, there was structural damage. But at the end of the day, not a single Palestinian was uh, killed. And today I read on CNN a horrible story. The headline is just atrocious, blaming Israel for millions of things that we haven't done. And then I think paragraph eight or nine buried deep down behind the lead is actual first-hand uh, testimony of a Palestinian who was present in the hospital saying, yeah, I saw dozens of Hamas and Islamic Jihad gunmen. He doesn't call them terrorists. He says resistance or fighters, but he says, I saw dozens of Hamas fighters inside the hospital when the Israelis came and they fought against the Israelis. This was, you know, buried down deep in the story. And the story was all about the destruction, etc. Yes, the pictures now, when you look at Shifa now, yes, there is destruction. But that's what happens when terrorists use infrastructure in order to fight, sadly. And uh, important to emphasize, no loss of life. Uh, there were hundreds of patients there, Palestinian patients. None of them were wounded or killed. And I think that is a tremendous tactical achievement that... I hope the IDF will be able to emulate itself in other operations that it will continue to do in the Gaza Strip, maybe in Lebanon, but we're focusing on Gaza now. And I'm sure that other militaries will have a good look at how the IDF was able to go into a very sensitive area, fulfill its mission of arresting or killing terrorists, taking weapons, taking funds, and doing it without killing civilians. And I think that's commendable. When you said earlier that um, it was like three weeks of evacuating civilians from the north, um, there were a lot of stories of um, civilians being killed on their way on dirt, you know, in the yeah. humanitarian corridor. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that happened? Let me tell you an interesting story of, uh, about an encounter I had with a New York Times reporter. I won't say her name, but stationed out of Cairo. There, was a there were two mysterious explosions on the Salah Adin Road, which is the main thoroughfare of the Gaza Strip. It's the main uh, road. It goes from north to south and basically connects with Rafah in, in the south, and it connects with the Erez crossing into Israel in the northern part. And it's the main road. That was the humanitarian corridor. That's through which, through that road, most Gazans evacuated from northern Gaza. That was the distinct, the uh, uh, designated uh, area, and that's where we did not attack uh, in any in, in any circumstance or scenario. There were two mysterious explosions. Uh, one of them, there was a truck involved, and the second one was a convoy of vehicles. And there were reports of uh, dozens of Palestinians killed. The, the knee-jerk response was, and the first, the, the first headlines in BBC, New York Times, and the other usual media outlets that are very harsh on Israel and sloppy in their professional standards, were Israel attacks humanitarian convoy X killed. I don't remember the number that they quoted. And we, of course, they, they were kind enough to ask us uh, uh, before they printed. And we started checking and investigating. Had any of our troops 
ground troops, air troops, uh, naval, had anybody struck artillery, had anybody struck in that area? And is there a chance that we had inadvertently uh, killed civilians who were trying to evacuate, which was, of course, contrary to our strategic uh, needs because we wanted people to feel safe and to evacuate. It took us three weeks to evacuate all of them. And of course, it would have been counter effective for us, for them to be afraid and not to feel safe to evacuate. The ones who would benefit from that, and I'll get to that later, is of course Hamas. So there were these two mysterious explosions. We started looking into first our military information that we had, check the air force, artillery, tanks, infantry, navy, anybody that has anything that can cause substantial damage and loss of life, did anybody fire? Were there any rounds that went astray? Any bomb bombs that are unaccounted for? No. And then we started looking at uh, visual uh, footage uh, from cameras, from uh, social media, both at the remains, the, the sad sights of bodies of people that have been killed there. And also there was one specific video of one of the explosions where you can see a guy, he's filming from the dashboard, the convoy is driving, and all of a sudden, a ball of fire erupts from the lower right-hand side, like on the road, lower the right shoulder, and it erupts down from down up and to the left in a, a ball of fire. Not um, like what it looks when you drop ordnance from the air. Much more like what it looks when you detonate an IED, an improvised explosive device, from the side. Looking at the bodies of the casualties, they also did not look like what we see happens to a human body after it is close to an explosion uh, by air dropped, air delivered ordnance. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the type of injuries, the color, I don't want to get too gra graphic, but it, it didn't look as if they had been killed by something dropped from the air, which is how we deliver bombs. So that led us to believe that something else was afoot. And I had hours, hours, four or five different phone calls every night with a certain, she calls herself, herself an Emmy-winning investigative visual journalist. And she was investigating, she basically wanted to prove that Israel had uh, killed those Palestinians and had fired towards the humanitarian corridor. I was trying to make the point that we actually hadn't and that she should be looking elsewhere and asking other people questions as to who would stand to gain from civilians being killed while they're trying to evacuate. And of course, it's a very easy answer. Hamas stands to gain. They did not want people to evacuate. They, we caught them and we showed it with visual evidence and with recordings, Hamas erecting roadblocks. Uh, on that very same route, and we filmed it from the air, roadblocks by Hamas, and we also had testimony of thugs, Hamas thugs, going in and taking the keys, snatching keys out of the ignition of Palestinian vehicles in order to uh, uh, make it impossible for them to evacuate. Testimony of the people whose keys yes. they took. Yes, testimony of Palestinians, and we released the audio recording of it. I remember it, it was a... a maybe half a day after it happened. So clear, clear evidence. So Hamas was doing this. Hamas was, had an interest in preventing civilians from leaving because Hamas wanted humanitarian shields to be there, to protect their assets. And Hamas knows very well that the most potent weapon that Hamas can uh, threaten Israel with is uh, international condemnations and uh, public opinion and dead civilians equals pressure on Israel. Whether they're justified or not, whether they were caused by Hamas or not, Israel gets the blame if civilians die, and Hamas wanted to create that situation. So they were making it very difficult for Palestinians to evacuate, and they stood to gain from it. And after I did four or five long conversations, it was nighttime between interviews, so I had long conversations with this so-called investigative journalist, no story appeared. After I sent her the videos of the recordings, other um, footage from social media uh, filmed by Palestinians, there was never a story printed. No visual investigation, no print form, nothing. 
And I called back and I, you know, I, I got a sense that she, the story wasn't going where she wanted it to go. So I called her a few days after and I asked, what, what's up with the story? You, you told me before that you know, you're filing tonight, a few nights ago. How's the story going and wh wh what's the lead? And oh, you know, all kinds of uh, reasons for it not to and no, uh, not happening, ta ta ta. And I said, what, well, really? You invested five hours in this and you told me that you had lots of people collecting in uh, information on the ground and conducting interviews and you had your vaunted visual investigations team. The New York Times has a very good and very funded, very rich invest visual investigations team. You had them all over it and no story? How come? Reportedly 50 Palestinians died. Why isn't that a story? Doesn't it matter who killed them? If it wasn't Israel, then it isn't a story. If someone else killed them, it's not. They died. So, I mean, we, 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 we've seen bodies, so people died. What did they die of? And until this day, the New York Times has not published a story about it. And I take that as, you know, an example, perhaps the example that I've been personally involved with, of, involved with, of the hypocrisy, the double standards, and the activist journalism that hides today, that masquerades for proper journalism, where you have activists, some of them acclaimed, who have won Emmy Prizes, who are just there out to get Israel. If they can't stick it to Israel, then it's probably not a story. Let's move on to something else. And that example is, uh, tells that story. That leads to the question of going into Rafa. There's a lot of international pressure to not go into Rafa, including on the part of the U.S. apparently. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the latest on that? I am, um, you know, I think it's, uh, the, 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 if there was a barometer for hypocrisy, it would shatter, just blow through the roof, listening to Egyptian officials citing humanitarian concerns for their reason that they object or strongly oppose Israeli action in Rafah. Uh, had they had any concern for humanitarian uh, issues, they would have opened the borders long time ago and allowed hundreds of thousands, if not more than that, million of Palestinians to evacuate themselves from a horrible situation and for a temporary, for a short period of time, uh, live in some kind of temporary housing refugee camp in Northern Sinai. Had that really been the issue? I don't think it is. I don't think that the Egyptians, I think that they could care much, uh, uh, they couldn't care less about uh, the well-being of Palestinians. They're using them as a tool against Israel. They look at the, const the rebuilding of Gaza as something future very lucrative. Lots of construction deals, lots of stuff that will move through Egypt lots of opportunities to take cutbacks and to uh, uh, um, take dividends of big international deals and organizations that will be there. And I think that they're looking at a situation where they want to preserve Hamas in power. They want Hamas to continue to be there and they don't want an area of total lawlessness in Gaza because what they care about is stability in Egypt. And if there's total instability in Gaza, I think their concern is that that will spill over into Egypt. And that is their only concern, the stability of their own regime, their own undemocratic uh, regime that they've been running, their military regime, um, their dictatorship. And that is, I think, what guides their decisions. I am saddened by the fact that most countries but most importantly, the U.S. have adopted um, this line of thinking. Uh, for I, I think it is mutually exclusive in the same sentence to say we support Israel's right to defend itself, to defeat Hamas, but we are against Israel uh, striking Rafah, striking Hamas in Rafah. Doesn't make sense because Israel cannot defeat Hamas if it doesn't go into Rafah. Why? Because Hamas is there, not because Rafah is such an important place. No, because Hamas is there. If Hamas had been in the former Gush Katif, the Muasi area, then the IDF would need to go there in order to defeat it. But there are four or five remaining Hamas battalions in Rafah, hiding amongst and under the civilians. They need to be dismantled. And most importantly, are smuggling tunnels that go from Egypt, 
the same Egypt that we just spoke about, into Gaza, through which all of the weapons that Hamas and the Islamic Jihad have, all of the weapons came through those tunnels. So in order for Israel to make sure that the October 7 doesn't happen in 2025 or 6 again, we need to make sure that we cut those tunnels, that we dig down, cut the tunnels and make that area untunnelable, if that's a word, in the future um, by various ways. And there are techniques how to do it. And uh, that's a pre that's an absolute basic condition for Israelis to live in safety. As long as those tunnels are open, the door will be open for Hamas to rebuild itself. And whenever, if they can, they will, because we're not going to defeat the idea of Hamas. We're not going to defeat the idea of radical, barbaric Islam. We're not going to defeat the idea of ISIS or the idea of Hamas. They continue to live on even after they are defeated militarily. So we have to make sure, Israel has to make sure, again, in order to prevent an October 7, in order to defend its civilians, that's what it's about. In order to do that, Israel has to cut the lines of supply of Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. And there's no way to defeat Hamas without doing that. Now, another level of complexity, when Israel, not if, when Israel will go into Gaza and deliver a strong blow against Hamas, that won't mean that the fighting will be over. We'll defeat Hamas in Rafah. We'll cut the tunnels. By the way, we'll do it after we film all of the tunnels and expose really what it is about, how big, how well furnished, how substantial these tunnels are so that people can understand we're not talking about some little tunnel where you can barely stand tall in. These are tunnels that are big enough for pickup trucks to drive in, some of them. Big, serious, commodity tunnels. Um, and once Israel will do that, then there will still be fighting because there will still be Hamas fighters and terrorists scattered around the Gaza Strip. And I don't think that they will surrender. They will continue to disguise themselves as civilians when necessary and take arms when uh, the opportune time avails itself. And we will have months, if not years, of what I would think would be low or mid-level intensity fighting in the Gaza Strip, even after we take Rafah. But to leave Rafah will, is basically saying we want Hamas to continue to exist and to see the light of day as an organization, uh, both as a military power and as a political organization and as sovereign in Gaza. And we don't want Israel to win. When anybody says ceasefire now without returning the hostages, Hamas surrendering, that means Hamas wins, Israel loses, and it was all for nothing from an Israeli perspective and a tremendous achievement for Hamas. And those who say, no, you mustn't take Hamas because of civilians, because of whatever, they're basically saying we want Hamas to win. So the other thing that has been uh, in the news quite a bit is this issue of humanitarian aid. We only have a few minutes left. Um, what's uh, what's the truth about the humanitarian aid? What what was the humanitarian aid situation before October seventh? What is it now, and what is the media getting wrong? The first and most important truth is that there is no famine in Gaza. People are suffering. People are at discomfort, hardship not to be underestimated or belittled, people are suffering as a result of Hamas's actions of attacking Israel on October the 7th and Israel's response to it. Uh, there is a need for tremendous humanitarian efforts in, across the board, construction, infrastructure, food, medicine, fuel, electricity, everything. There's a need for everything and many parts of Gaza will take years to rebuild. Um, Humanitarian suffering is, has been weaponized by Hamas through the use of international media and public diplomacy. They have weaponized uh, the use of humanitarian suffering and they have worked in cahoots with different UN organizations that are basically uh, in violation of their very basic charter. They're working with a terrorist organization, a dark, medieval, oppressive regime. That's what UNRWA is doing, uh, allegedly for the sake of helping Palestinians, 
But what UNRWA has been doing since Hamas took power is just to serve as a front for Hamas. Hamas officials have said it themselves. We, we're not responsible for the civilians. That's the UN responsible. Our money goes to building tunnels underground, buying weapons, training our fighters, and making sure that our people are taken care of. The guys above the ground, the peasants, who cares about them? That's for the UN to take care of. And the fact that UNO has been there using international taxpayers' money so generously and so gullibly uh, contributed by so many countries, that's the real travesty. And now, and, and, and now the situation is that, yes, what Israel is doing, I think a bit late in retro perspective, we should have gotten at this faster. We should have taken the initiative with regards to um, providing humanitarian aid and we shouldn't have waited naively for UN and other NGOs to do their job because they're not interested in doing their job. They're there for various other political purposes, but it's not the top priority is not to care for Palestinian civilians. It is many other things self-sustainment, supporting Hamas, ruining it for Israel, many other things, but it's not caring for Palestinian civilians. And what Israel should have done earlier on was to build the humanitarian zone administered by Israel, take control of it, channel aid towards that area, and then force everybody to work there where it suits us, instead of asking humanitarian organizations to do the same thing, which eventually failed. That's the reason why there are internally displaced Palestinians in Rafah and Chayyim because that's where UNRWA told them to go. If we had built a good initiative, a realistic, solid, earnest initiative, people would have gone there. Hindsight. But what's happening now is that the biggest challenge is uh, the, uh, the delivery inside Gaza. Lots of aid is coming in. It gets to UNRWA or other facilities, or it gets across the border into Gaza, and then it is stuck and I'm talking about 20-30% of the aid that is stuck in either UN centers or on the ground waiting to be distributed inside Gaza. And that is what's causing a lot of the shortages. There's more food coming into the Gaza Strip today than there was before October 7. Many people do the lazy comparison of, oh, you said that there were a thousand trucks coming into Gaza uh, before October 7 and now there's only 250-300. Yeah, of course, but before it was also clothes, construction material, uh, aggregates, bulk material for agriculture and many things that take a lot of loads. But food, there's more food and uh, medicine coming and water coming in now than there ever was. So to claim that Israel is obstructing or Israel isn't supplying enough, that's propaganda and lies against Israel, very clearly focused at undermining. Today, Israel has a ground corridor operating in Kerem Shalom. The Egyptians are pumping in aid through Rafah. Israel opened a second ground corridor in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, basically paved a new road that provides aid to the northern part of the Gaza Strip directly without having the need to go south and then to go north. And aid is being delivered via the sea. Uh, offloaded, already has been done a few times and it will grow in capacity as the American pier will be completed in a month or so's time. Then we will be distributing from the sea as well. And air is being airdropped by various generous countries led by the US, but the Egyptians, Jordanians, Emirates and a few other countries, the French have been dropping in. So I think the problem is more of distribution inside Gaza. The fact that UNRWA is compromised as a Hamas front, where we see Hamas thugs taking trucks, basically just robbing them, stealing the trucks and taking them to Hamas warehouses. And then you see goods labeled not for sale, humanitarian aid, not for sale. You see them on Gaza markets at exorbitant prices, which is, I think, the, the peak of cynicism by, uh, by Hamas and those who are uh, corrupt enough to, to work with them. So to summarize, there's a sad situation. Palestinians there are suffering. I wouldn't want uh, to be there and to be in their place. Uh, but this is a result of choices made by Hamas, by their priorities, and by the fact that they launched the attack on October the 7th. Israel is, I think, started late, but now catching up in terms of 
taking initiative of the humanitarian situation, and Israel won't have a choice but to own the problem because all of those organizations who are getting paid interna international organizations from international taxpayers' money, they're not doing that, that job, sadly. With one minute left, um, what, what last uh, thing should people know? You know? At the end of this, Israel will defeat Hamas. It'll take years to rebuild the Gaza Strip and Israel will need help in it. The Palestinians will need help in it. Uh, hopefully, a local or a diplomatic regional framework can be established that will find the funding, the goodwill, the material and the personnel to do that. That's in the work now. Uh, but I think that as long as Israel doesn't hold Iran to task, Iran is the source behind this. Iran is the organization and the country that funds arms and fuels instability and violence in the Middle East. They have more than 20 proxies all over, seven of them along our borders with the specific intent of killing Jews. And as long as we don't change our strategy and hold their feet to the fire, and there's many ways of doing that, then I think they will continue and we will see many more years of suffering, of fighting, of death and of killing. And I don't want that, not for my children and not for the Arabs who live on the other side of the fence. I wish them well, but I wish myself and my kids well, and I want us to live here in peace and prosperity. The only way we can do that is by addressing the source of violence and instability currently in the Middle East, and that is the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you.